Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Happy Kwanzaa, especially, because, mm -hmm. I mean, for us African Americans, <laughs> uh, that's an important holiday. And, um, you know, Kwanzaa's exactly as old as I am. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> actually, it's a year younger. I'm sorry. It was, I think it was 66. Mm -hmm. Kwanzaa was born. The um, the Jesus of Kwanzaa was born in 1966. I was born the year before that. But um, today is a very scary day, Michael. We are walking a tightrope. If YouTube decides that they don't like something that we say in this very program, our channel will be deleted permanently. Yeah. So I propose that you and I stare at each other for 90 minutes mm -hmm. and not say anything. Yeah, or I don't know, man. We could do like a Christmas present unboxing thing, or we could like do a mukbang, just eat for the whole stream. I think that's what YouTube wants us to do is just eat. Or we could just talk about the news the way that MSNBC and CNN do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That, yeah, might be, could, that might be fun, actually. We could get some CIA people to come in and just tell us what to think. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. They've got a lot of ideas mm -hmm. over the CIA. Yeah. They've been, been very creative over the years. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, yeah. So here we are. It's um, the holidays, and we are that much closer to World War III, mm -hmm. which is cool. Spent my entire political life, my entire political career, which began when I was about 19 years old, with my primary objective being to do whatever I can to stop the next world war. <laughs> and apparently almost no one has listened to me because we're getting closer and closer, but I don't know. You want to talk about something else first, something less momentous. Oh. Well, I, I could talk about uh, the, Oh, the fantastic musician M tomb participated in the first Kwanzaa passed away this year. Uh, yeah, dude, the keyboard player M tomb. He played, uh, this is Joel Schlossberg in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh just some kwanzaa celebration before we before we get going yeah dude m tomb was amazing he uh played in miles davis's band everybody should listen to late miles when miles was doing more r&b more pop covers and then uh yeah m tomb did that uh hit juicy fruit with his band that became the sample for biggie's uh juicy oh really when you say yeah. when you say late miles davis do you mean post tutu yeah i'd say tutu is a good turning point yeah I listened to that album. Did I tell you? I think I said this to you or somewhere. Yeah. I listened to that album every day for about a year when it came out in 1986, I think it was. Yeah. I was in London then. It was mm -hmm. great. Yeah. No, I mean, I wasn't supposed to like it because that's the that's the album that, you know, where, where Miles sold out. And for the fifth embraced, time. For the fifth time, exactly. And embraced Fusion fully. And But it's a beautiful, brilliant album. You think it's like his best, don't you? Well, I like... I, I just like that he kept changing and experimenting, and I've, yeah. I've grown to appreciate... I, I like We Want Miles a little bit more. That's kind of a more live album, and there's some better tunes on there, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But I, I've i gotten an appreciation for smooth jazz. Um, wow. This happened when... Uh, uh, not to bring up Ye again, but when Ye did his uh, Christian <laughs> rock album... Well, when Ye did his Christian album, he had Kenny G on a track. And That's I was, right. I was a jazz hipster, and I'm like, Oh, Kenny G, this is gonna suck. Oh, he's doing his same ham fisted, sharp uh, sax solo. That, mm -hmm. but I watched all the hip hop reviewers and they were like, Man, I hated this album, but Kenny G went in and did his thing. Man, <laughs> Kenny G does what he always does. Kenny G held it down. Yeah. And I realized like actual black people who like to listen to good music and have a good time love smooth jazz. And white hipsters hate it because it's not complicated and it's not it doesn't make them feel superior to everybody else for listening to it. Actual black people. Yeah. You know, like I need to I need to meet some of them. The kind that don't work for the CIA, not the frizzy haired people who are on the CIA's website. But like, man, these days, which black person does not work for the CIA? Yeah, because all the major corporations are somehow attached to the CIA or associated with the CIA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since since the racial reckoning summer, every corporation in the country has had to have multiple black people on the front of their website, which I'm assuming it's tapped out. I mean, there can't be any more black people left to go around to They've hired all of them <laughs> to be tokens for corporate America. But yeah, but you know, that means that all those black people on those websites, you know, all those Netflix shows, they're all basically working for the CIA. We know that CIA is all up in Hollywood. So if they're working for Hollywood, which 
an incredible number of black people have been working for Hollywood in the last two years. Yeah, everybody's mobbed up, man. Everybody's corrupt. The establishment, the cathedral has colonized all aspects of our life and there's nowhere left to go. Yeah, man, we were talking about how the 70s were such a great uh, mm -hmm. time for racial harmony in that, mm -hmm. you know, you had overt racism and yeah. in, in culture and you had, but you actually had the races getting along in a working class manner. And uh, when we did a class on uh, black exploitation films of the 70s, you really got mm -hmm. to see this. We, we never had a chance to really dive into Car Wash, but Car Wash is like the preeminent example of that. Mm -hmm. But also those movies are the most uh, politically subversive thing you've ever seen. Like it's shocking how these things got made. And uh, as affirmative action keeps uh, ramping up again in uh, universities and in government institutions, everybody needs to watch the spook that sat by the door. That's the blueprint. That's how we take over. That's how we win. Black exploitation and especially the spook are, as you said, the most subversive and radical movies in the history of cinema. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can get into this later, but or at another time, or you can take our course, uh, black exploitation. Actually, it's a, another school now, but we should teach that again. Um, yeah, it, it uh, the seventies were a golden age. I mean, this is post code, right? The code had been lifted in nineteen sixty six. And um, it just it just gave rise to this enormous flowering of creativity and, and boldness in Hollywood. That's when that's when directors and producers were actually celebrated for saying something different and new and challenging and provocative. And that's what black exploitation was from top to bottom. I mean, they challenged every norm of bourgeois America and did so successfully. Yeah. And kind of um, also, as you said, I mean, those were all interracial productions you know you had whites and blacks and often whites were in the film usually as villains usually but not always and there was a whole lot of collaboration with white filmmakers in making the black exploitation films um, and every, I, everybody had a sense of humor about themselves like it, everybody was it. going to play their own stereotype of themselves you that's know? exactly right mm -hmm. yeah that that's the main thing and you and i were talking last week about we need more racist jokes and that's mm -hmm. that's what we mean it's about it's about it's about taking racism and race not seriously you know if you if you joke about it you're kind of undercutting its seriousness and its power you know but if you if you if you tiptoe around race and racism like they're these scary monsters well they become scary monsters but if you make fun of them the way that richard Pryor did and george carlin did and lenny bruce did in the 1960s 70s and 80s then it's just lighter and less powerful and less 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 destructive and people are happier and also easier. It's easier for people to get along between the races. One of the worst possible phrases. But, you know, we have to use that because everybody's so invested in reifying race all the time. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we're not actually going to talk about race tonight much, are we? We're not going to race topics, do we? Or do we? Not really. We'll, we'll, we might find a way to work it in. Uh, we're, we're oh, Americans. No, uh, George Santos. There's a race angle to that. Okay. I mean, we're, we're Americans. We will find some way to inject race into the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like NPR, like we get a check every time. we print. I mean, no matter what your politics are, you know, Americans are famously obsessed with race and do take any opportunity, even those like us, you know, to inject it into the conversation. But mm -hmm. yeah, George Santos, I you want to get that one over with, because I got to say, I only knew a little bit about it. And I actually want you to to uh, school me on this. What actually happened and who is this guy and why should we care? OK, if you want to dive right into it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's representative elect from New York. I guess it's a little bit significant because, I mean, it's, he's a Republican elected in New York. He was a little bit of an upset when he won. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it came across that he was lying on his resume, lying in his bio, that he uh, did not graduate from the college that he claimed to graduate from, that he did not work for Goldman Sachs, that uh, his grandmother was not Jewish, that he's actually Catholic. Uh, he lied about being Jewish. Oh, um, yeah. He, uh, potentially made up a Holocaust story that his grandmother escaped the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Uh, there's old tweets saying that he's biracial, that he's half black, um, which I could forgive him for because he's Latino and pretty much any Latino has Afro Latino heritage in there somewhere. So, you know, that's passable. Like race is made up anyways, as, as we say. Uh, oh, so and. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, his sexuality, he kind of exaggerated his homosexuality. He says he's gay now, but he was 
married to a woman for a long time and divorced her. Uh, but yeah, his, his whole bio is, is made up. I think he also said his parents died in 9-11, which is another lie. Jesus. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. But politically, this is very important in that it is evidence, maybe even proof, that being Jewish or gay mm -hmm. is an advantage. Yes, being half society. black, being black, Jewish, and gay. Black. And yeah, notice that if he didn't try to, uh, he didn't try to earn upward mobility in our society by pretending to be white. Right. So how bad can anti-Semitism and homophobia be right now if uh, a politician is choosing to identify as gay and Jewish for his own political advantage? I got to believe you're fairly safe in this country if you're Jewish or gay these days. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's proof of it. Although there certainly has been a rise in anti-Semitism and certainly homophobia lately. And I've been pretty pissed off about the rise in homophobia lately, which we will definitely talk about, by the way, tonight. Mm -hmm. Um but um, but no, I mean, those things have been less powerful, less and less powerful over the years and especially now. Um, but who knows? I mean, you know, there is a significant homophobic and anti-Semitic faction on the right who are, you know, no bones about it. I mean, they hate gays and Jews. So, you know, I don't think they're going to gain serious power in this country, but they have some influence on the edges and they influence culture for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. The uh, the Republican take on this is uh, oh imagine if the roles are reversed like because he's uh, I guess the New York uh, prosecutors are looking into it and seeing if he broke any laws in the process of lying about his resume lying about his work history mm. uh, but you know uh, so Nebula four hundred eight in the chat says breaking news Ilhan Omar Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff are holding a joint press conference tomorrow about why politician li politician lying is ground for immediate resignation and you know. The hypocrisy, you know, Joe Biden lied about his education. Uh, yeah, Ilan Omar lied about marrying her brother. Eric Swalwell uh, lies every lies every day. Yeah, he's he's right down the road here. He's 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 the next Congress district, congressional district down here in, in Alameda. Yeah, that guy is just a, he's a serial liar. Mm -hmm. um, that guy's amazing, Swalwell. I mean, I I've never seen. Ilan Omar has had moments where I listen to her and I think, okay, she makes some sense. Even when I disagree with her, you know, Swalwell, every word out of that guy's mouth is just the slimiest political speak I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, the hypocrisy is astounding. But what else is new? Yeah, I mean, I mean also, in Washington. that's the job description of a politician is a liar, right? Like, pretty much. Yeah. I don't know. Ron Paul never lied. Ron Paul never lied. Yeah. <laughs> Except about Bernie, the authorship of those newsletters. Yeah, right. Bernie Sanders never lied. Yeah. Did Bernie Sanders lie? No, he well, he lied in terms of what he promised to do when he was elected. He mm -hmm. said, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z, like stop wars, and then it goes ahead and votes for every war there's been. Um, but yeah, um Santos, was he a MAGA guy? I don't think so. No, nah, I don't think so. Yeah, just a regular Republican. Yeah. Boy, it's interesting that Republican, I mean, think about this. So establishment Republicans now find it to be advantageous to identify as Jewish and gay. Mm -hmm. Boy, have things changed. I mean, again, that just tells you where the culture is these days, mm -hmm. where, you know, it helps you to be a member of one of those groups. We have come a long way. Some people on the right will think it's a, we've come to a bad place, but I think it's I think it's certainly a good thing. Mm -hmm. Good thing that it's that it's actually politically advantageous to be a member of those groups. But um, but lying like that, like, gee, and about his parents dying in 9-11, he was really going for every virtue signaling opportunity, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's the thing is, like, you have to connect yourself to the founding myths of this country. You have yeah, to, exactly. You have to connect yourself to the Holocaust. You have to connect yourself to 9-11. Yeah, right. Yeah, the whole he meant. Wow. Holocaust and 9-11. That would be really good if you had if you had uh, relatives in both. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. COVID. COVID, COVID survivor. Yeah. I mean, he needs to be also descended from the Plains Indians too, or something mm -hmm. like that. You know? Yeah. Um, but um, so he's going to stay in Congress though, right? Yeah. He's staying in Congress. He was on a, uh, Tulsi was filling in for Tucker and uh, she interviewed him and he's oh. committed to serving the American people and owning up to his mistakes. Did Tulsi give her, the, give him the business? 
yeah, she she scolded him. You know, what does integrity mean to you? You know, gave her gave him that line. Um, I have always suspected that Tulsi is on the take. Yeah, I mean, she's a CFR girl. She's. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I actually, I suspect that she was on the take from Russia. Oh. I mean, the way she talked about Syria and Russia, I don't know about Ukraine. I haven't actually followed her on Ukraine, but, um, which is, I guess, a good question, because that would be the ultimate test of whether she's on the take with Russia. But even though I agreed with her in the moment on the politics of the Syrian civil war, et cetera, I, it, just the way she spoke seemed so rehearsed. It, it was just too plotted out. Um, it sounded scripted to me. I don't think she's on the take or getting any money from anybody. I think she probably has friends who are. Uh, I think she's probably in inner circles that are like that. But I don't think because she she's also very much supports the establishment uh, military. Like she is for the wars that are against terror. She's against the wars that are for terror. So she doesn't want to send money to Al Qaeda when they're brave freedom fighters. She wants to fight Al Qaeda. She's 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 logically consistent in in what she wants to do, I think. OK, this may be a little stretch here. Probably mm -hmm. is a little stretch, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it might be interesting. So Tulsi's weird background, the weirdest part of her weird background is her father, who is a politician in Hawaii, who I believe. Um has as his major cause or at least was one of his major causes anti-homosexuality yeah so, well hang on so i mean i don't know if tulsi's her tulsi herself is uh anti-gay but her dad certainly is right I, I don't know the merits of that i think uh she's just what is it hindu or she has some i guess her family has some religious backgrounds that gay I, I i'm really skeptical of claims like that like that somebody gave to a religious organization that was pro-family and anti-gay like those were a little bit more ubiquitous 10 years ago and a little bit more accepted and i think that's often an easy way to get opposition research on somebody that's distasteful okay to the democrats well okay i was gonna say something outlandish and by the way what i'm saying now oh, please, makes please. me sound like a total libtard i sound like a complete establishment hack here you sound like barry weiss yes no exactly i'm i'm like a male barry weiss right now um yeah, so I just I was thinking, I mean, homosexuality is the cultural issue that divides the Russian establishment from the American establishment. Of course, they're bigger questions that they're really divided on having to do with geopolitics and, you know, territories and stuff like that. But but on cultural stuff, Russian political people are always talking about our gays and our love for the queers and the rainbow flag. And, you know, I mean, they really don't like that stuff. And they consider that to be a sign of the weakness and debauchery of the West is that we embrace the gays and the gays apparently have taken over our culture, et cetera. So I was oh, just that's thinking. A, that's hmm? a big cultural splitting point in, between Ukraine and Russia right now. Uh, I think no, Ukraine I, know. I saw that the anti LGBTQ hate speech bill. Right. And you know, that is just to get more weapons from the West because Ukraine, I believe is pretty similar. Uh, in its sexual culture, they're not friends of the gays either mm -hmm. in Ukraine. I mean, they are just willing to sell out anything to get more guns and money from us. But yeah, I was just thinking, you know, that would be, you know, one way in which Tulsi and people in Russia could get along. I'm just saying, you know, I don't know. No, that's a, that's not outlandish. That's a smart, sophisticated, subversive take on it. I, I like that. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm ashamed of it. That's because I'm a little bit more <laughs> sympathetic to the homophobia. Uh, I'm not <laughs> what <laughs> I'm not personally homophobic, but I respect other cultures right to be homophobic and to oh, have their own attitudes about sex and sexuality. And Of yeah. course. I mean, I remember this is God. Whenever Hillary Clinton was uh, secretary of state, I remember her putting all this pressure on Angola mm -hmm. to rescind its anti-gay laws. And it was straight up, you know, we will give you foreign aid in this amount if you rescind that law. And I'm like, that's just straight up cultural. It's real imperialism. I mean, that is. God. And that's what so much of this is about. You know, by the way, the alt right, the frog Twitter types, they talk about globo homo. 
mm -hmm. as the as the international sort of the American empire. And there's a lot to that critique because you'll see, you'll see, and we've talked about this a little bit before, you know, you'll see that the foreign policy establishment and the media that follows it in this country often put in front gay issues when they deal with international relations, when they're demonizing some foreign leader they don't like and want to get rid of, like Putin. The, as I said many times, the first thing that American housewives knew about Vladimir Putin was that he was homophobic back during the Sochi Olympics when he became infamous for the first time among ordinary normie Americans. And that's what they kept saying. He's homophobic. He's a homo. He hates gays and they, they kill gays and they torture gays. And, um, and, um, it's really interesting the way this issue has become central in foreign relations, in geopolitics. It has become central in the fights we're now seeing across the globe over who controls what territory. It often, often you'll see homosexuality and the LGBTQ plus blah, 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 blah agenda always being fought over. Um, I just, I never would have anticipated that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, who, who would have thought that would become the thing, you know, that, the, that nations would be fighting over, but it's a thing. And I'm, I'm just now trying to figure out what this is about. I mean, I know what it's about from the American side. I mean, they're imperialists and they want everyone to live like Americans in New York and Boston and San Francisco live like not, not Americans in the rest of the country, but they want all of the world to live like we do, you know, in San Francisco. So the LGBT agenda is front and center there. It's just, it's part of a disciplining process. If you have to have the right, the right beliefs about race and sexuality to be part of the cool club. And if you're part of the cool club, then we won't invade your country and bomb you into submission. Yeah, I'm waiting for a Jeff Schoenberger or somebody really smart, really read, well read on a yeah. queer theory to talk about how the... Uh, ideology of the of the global uh hegemon empire is homosexuality and uh that queer identity is basically the opposite of queerness yep um i mean i'm trying to think of why why they do this why they push um queerness on the world and i think it is very deep. It's a very deep thing. I think they actually are attacking tradition or they need to attack tradition in order to expand the American empire because the American empire, almost by definition, must be a modernist or modern entity. Um, they're spreading a particular kind of American modernism or modernity across the world. Uh, and of course, homosexuality is, you know, the newest addition to to polite discourse, to respectable discourse in the modern world. And so it makes sense to me because if you have, if you are, if you legalize gay marriage alone, if you just do that, I mean, that's a major fuck you to the Orthodox church. I mean, the whole Orthodox church is challenged by that, just that one thing. But if you're having, if you're having gay characters on your TV shows and you're having open uh, out gays in political leadership and in charge of your institutions again i mean russia and many other countries um are intertwined with their religious histories and the churches that dominate those countries all of which i think are in some way or another anti-homosexual so if you push forward and you successfully push forward an lgbt thing into a country like that you will be necessarily subverting their traditional culture in the most f fundamental way because that you know man woman and the family the heterosexual family is at the center of most of those cultures russian culture chinese culture i mean it's right and so if you can push homosexuality and gay marriage and all that that comes with it on those countries successfully the the traditional leadership will lose its cultural grounding it will lose its basis for legitimacy because they will now believe in things that are outdated, outmoded, barbaric, and from the past. The way that we in America think about our crusty old homophobic conservatives, not a single Republican, not a single Republican, even Marjorie Taylor Greene, even Lauren Boebert are 
outwardly homophobic. No one. You cannot win elective office, even in rural Alabama today, and be anti-gay. So that battle has been long won in this in this country, but it is yet to be even fought in other countries. And it's not a coincidence that that is the leading edge of American imperialism. Because again, even though I'm super pro-gay and super pro-sexual freedom, I oppose this stuff because it is it's imposing on what I'm with you on this. It is imposing on other people our way of life and our way of thinking for our own advantage. Yeah. Uh, you brought up uh, Africa, Angola earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've been wanting to figure out a way to talk about Africa more. Uh, there was a Africa Congress, Africa summit that Joe Biden attended. And, uh, you know, basically China and the United States are in a bidding war over Africa, over developing Africa because, uh, you know, as their population rises and develops and becomes uh, more industrialized, they are the final frontier, the final uncolonized part of the whole world uh, that we're fighting over. And China has a huge advantage by not pushing homosexuality on yeah. uh, on these countries. That's totally right. Um, China's already won that, by the way. I mean, I don't think I mean, the U.S. has a military, a powerful military presence in Africa. AFRICOM, the African Command. How many bases do they have? In fact, Catherine Ebright, who's going to be on the show in a week or two um, on Unregistered, that's her, We talked. That's exactly what we talked about. We talked about U.S. military presence in Africa. And I forget the number of bases that have been located by Scott, by journalists, is in the, it's dozens. There's dozens of American military bases of some sort across Africa. So that's something the U.S. has. But in terms of real establishment in Africa, China's winning. I mean, they they have all these major economic deals with all sorts of countries in Africa. They've invested an incredible amount of resources and labor. They send their workers by the thousands into Africa to build these projects that are all becoming part of the Belt and Road Initiative, which are integrating all of Europe and Asia and Africa um, in this transportation and economic network that is going to be, if not controlled, dominated by China because China will be the one to have created it. Um, roads, bridges, tunnels, ports, airports, all connecting everything from Lisbon, Portugal, to Shanghai, all the way to Cape Town. The Ch China's building that and they have developed, because of that, they've developed very friendly, tight relationships with dozens of countries on all three continents, which the United States has not done because the United States for decades has been busy invading, subverting, bombing, seeking regime change, all the rest of it, killing many, many people, and thereby pissing off lots and lots of people who live in Asia, Africa, and Europe. Um, so China's winning that. The nice thing is that they are doing it with economics first, their their strategy is to invest in these countries to give these to to help build the infrastructure in these countries to invest in those countries to win their support rather than imposing imposing their their programs on those countries through military force which is what the united states has always done military force and economic extortion right like like hillary clinton tried to do with angola you know with foreign aid telling them we will give you money if you do this that or the other thing for us um, it's all it's all coercive. That's been the it's all been external coercion. That's American empire building. Chinese empire building has been about making deals and giving people better roads, better electrical grids and all the rest of it. Um, and so guess who's going to win that? Guess who's going to have more friends at the end of the day? In fact, we know that now there. Um, if you look at United Nations votes on key issues, you will see that countries that represent 80% of the world's population consistently now vote against the United States and with Russia and China. 80% of the population, basically, of the world's population lives in a country that is officially now sympathetic, if not fully aligned, with Russia and China, not the U.S. of A. Mm -hmm. That is a momentous change. Man, it's like we've lost the lesson of the 20th century that uh, the right way to build an empire is through free trade, right? Yep. And uh, Russia and China seem to be winning on that front. Right. 
So the United States, it was always managed to trade. And what they would do was if a country refused to deal with us in our managed trade system, which was established in World War II, we would put the heat on them, you know, either in a big way, like with Japan and Germany, or in smaller ways um, by various forms of economic coercion, sanctions, like with Russia now, uh, smaller military inc incursions, um, all sorts of economic bribery, et cetera, uh, which, you know, in the long run, now that's what, this is the fruit it is bearing. That strategy of about 70 years is now producing a world that is largely hostile to the United States and that would much rather deal with China and the Soviet Union and Russia, I'm also the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, this is the world you and I were both born into will no longer exist soon. I mean, we're going to be living in a very, very different geopolitical world very soon. Yeah, man, I think the writing was on the wall when we, the United States spoiled all the goodwill from 9-11 uh, is pretty much the entire globe was on our side after right. that terrorist attack. And then, you know, the neocons spoiled it with these imperialist wars that they had planned for decades. Right. And yeah. And people forget, I mean, people often talk about, you know, Iraq 2003 as being the moment when the United States pissed off the world. And that it pissed off a bunch of the world for sure then, but it happened before in 2001, right after the, the invasion of Afghanistan was a NATO operation. And NATO, I mean, Afghanistan is nowhere near the North Atlantic. So what on earth is NATO doing in Afghanistan? But that sent a very clear message, right, to Russia, China, and the rest of the world that NATO is owned and owned by the United States and will and can go anywhere in the world to bomb your ass mm -hmm. if you don't cooperate with us. And China and Russia have always been, at least since the 60s, the major powers who have been unwilling to subordinate themselves to the United States. And now we see this is shaping up. Finally, Russia and China finally have enough power and enough friends internationally to make something about that, to mm -hmm. do something about that. And with the Ukraine war going the way it's going, I can't, I just heard somebody today. Who was it? Some major, oh yeah, it was a, one of the, somebody in Congress, some jackass in Congress talking about how today he said this, that that we now know that we the Ukraine has destroyed the Russian military. Really? Well, then why do we need to give them $110 billion? It's just not true at all. Russia right now is amassing a huge army with all sorts of new weapons and new troops in Ukraine and on the border. They are gearing up for a major, probably the final offensive. It's the last thing. I mean, it, it's the farthest thing from true that the Russian military has been degraded. Russian military is probably more powerful now than it was in February. I bet it is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, anyway, so these are momentous times. Things are shifting, but yeah. I just hope I just hope I just hope it shifts without war. I good Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's so hard to talk to people about this because they'll they'll tell me I watch Fox News. I watch MSNBC, I watch CNN, I read the New York Times, I read the Atlantic. Um, I read this huge, diverse range of opinion. I read the BBC for an international opinion. <laughs> right. And they're all telling me yeah. that uh, Russia is completely destroyed and devastated and that Ukraine is going to win at any moment now. And oh, I'm yeah. an informed citizen, I, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, back in the day, if you told me that you read about an issue in the times the bbc the atlantic and cnn i would say yeah you're extremely well informed that's a great cr great cross section of opinion on on this one thing well you might notice that they all say exactly exactly the same thing about the ukraine war <laughs> without any deviation whatsoever and then you might also notice that the rest of the world as i've said 80 percent of the world thinks of that war completely differently everybody should please please go look at the media in other countries and how they're covering the war. It is a, it's night and day. And I'm not talking about the Russian media, by the way, I'm talking about any media that's outside the West. They talk about this war completely differently and they generally are on the side of Russia or at least not on the side of us. Yeah. Which is so frustrating. Uh, you got a Kwanzaa gift here from uh, Mark Sermon. Keep killing it. Bad, Thad. happy new year. You are not alone and you do have value. Hope you're all doing well. Thank you, Mark Sermon. Love your name. Love you. 
appreciate that very, very much. Yeah, uh, thanks for keeping the lights on here. Uh, I did want to talk <laughs> about censorship a little bit because uh, we are on the chopping block and uh, we're talking about free speech a lot on our own saying well, that, you know. We haven't talked about Taiwan. Uh, we got we got to do a little Taiwan before we move on to domestic stuff. Okay, uh, there's a clip I want to play. Then uh, Oliver oh, I'm sorry. Moore. Yeah, you, it's all good. Um, okay, cool. To, if you want to talk about Taiwan, yeah, we'll yeah. definitely talk about Taiwan. But uh, Oliver North was on uh, Fox. Somebody was filling in for Hannity, and uh, he was tying in the whole Russian aid and made a comment about Taiwan. And for those who don't remember Oliver North, he was a National Security Council under Reagan in the '80s during the Iran Contra affair. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, another instance of uh, cable news putting on a uh, former military, <laughs> former intelligence, military intelligence person, he's, uncritically he's a, as an expert. He's a convicted felon. Yeah. Oliver North. Yeah. For Iran Contra. Yeah. No, he broke major laws and did time, I think, for it. But mm -hmm. he was certainly convicted. He's a felon. OK. Well, <laughs> he's a apparently criminal. he's an expert, too. <laughs> well, he's that. He is an expert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Is that money well spent? The, the president's assuring us that he's going to deal with it responsibly. But $110 billion, uh, American people aren't seeing that kind of money. It's coming out of their pockets. Well, it's coming out of all of our pockets, but it's money well spent. I, in my humble opinion, and this is very much like what Ronald Reagan did back in the 80s, and I do have some experience with that. I know that makes me a lot older than most of our viewers. But in fact, he, he believed in supporting freedom fighters. He did it in Latin America. He did it in Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique. He did it in Afghanistan. Those people were willing, as the Ukrainian people are, to use their blood and our bullets. And by the way, most of that 110 billion total between the 45, the 1.7, and the previous 65, over, 1 point, over 110 billion, is spent here in the United States. It's provided to contractors and defense logisticians and the kinds of people who build the kinds of systems that we're getting. So most of that money is spent here in America. Good, hardworking Americans have the jobs. And when you look at that kind of an investment, what would be the difference if when the giant does awake, and that's all, that's all about communist China, it's just not a plug for this book. The idea of it is to make sure that they get the right message and to make sure that Putin gets the right message. No more invasions. And that means the people in Taiwan are going to need the same kinds of weapon systems that we're now providing to the Ukrainian. Quick aside, in 1987, during the Iran-Contra hearings, which was everybody was watching them back then, 1987, um, in the summer of 87, I was in New York City then. And I just one day I, wa I walked down the street and I saw this guy walking down the street with his black, plain black T-shirt he had made. It said it just said in big, bold letters, fuck terrorist Oliver North, which I appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, so their blood and our bullets. Could you be more cynical, Ollie? Like this? Yes, we know you want to you want to fight this war to the last Ukrainian. Yeah, we know that you've made that very clear. Thank you for making it super clear. Yes, for making it explicit. You don't mind having other people die for our cause. But we'll supply them the bullets because we're great at that. And the, the, the double bonus there, he says, is that all that money or most of that money actually goes to us, goes to our defense contractors right here in the United States of America. He's proud of that. It's a welfare program and he's proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the cynicism is off the charts, which I really appreciate because that is largely what's going on. He is right. Thank God. Yeah. Well, we interpret it as cynicism. He interprets it as op optimism. Right. Yeah. Or it's just like he thinks that's all a good thing. I mean, it's it's great to have other people die to advance American interests. Um, and he thinks it's great to to support the defense industry here, the military industrial, because he's he's lived on that his whole life. So why not? He, he doesn't see anything wrong with that. This is this has to do with one's perspective, determining one <laughs> determining one's um, valuation of particular phenomena. Mm -hmm. He has Ollie North has a very particular perspective. And uh, oh, man. Yeah. The irony of all this uh, when he brags about, uh, you know, <laughs> essentially Iran Contra and uh, everything Reagan was doing in South America. And right. then uh, at the end, as a hard line, he says, hey, Z, hey, Putin, don't invade other countries. That's the rule. You don't invade other countries. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. 
you need to uh what is it respect uh the autonomy of nation states or something like that yeah mm -hmm. national autonomy yeah uh-huh right ali north is great about that mm -hmm. yeah the hypocrisy is pretty pretty amazing um but no it's wonderful and max blumenthal tweeted that out by the way and he said something like you know a stunningly honest declaration by oliver north which it was and you know it's very useful when members of the establishment i guess actually i'm not sure ollie north is really a member of the establishment anymore but he certainly used to be he used to run sing, almost single-handedly used to run american foreign policy that was the point of iran contra was that it was all done in secret they bought um what was it they gave money to iran in exchange for guns that iran gave to the contras it was some it was a triangle i forget exactly the direction it went in but that's what it was um, but it was all in secret is the point that Reagan and Oliver North directly were running American foreign policy without anyone knowing, including Congress. They had no mm -hmm. idea this was going on and they thought, but they, you know, the ends justified the means they were ending, they were stopping communism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there, there you have it. The explicit, uh, I guess, Ukrainification of Taiwan that, uh, Taiwan, that they're literally using this conflict as a model for a future conflict with China, and they're licking their lips at the prospect. Right, right. So Taiwan, okay. Um, mm, it's a scary one. So in 1979, Jimmy Carter officially adopted the One China policy, meaning that the United States would recognize Taiwan as part, legitimately part of China, which is what the CCP wanted. You know, this is this is during the era of rapprochement and detente and new relations between China and the US. And since 1979, that has been the official policy of the United States. One China. Until August of 2022, when Nancy Pelosi decided to visit Taiwan. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so it's February 24th, the beginning of the Ukraine war, when it really turned. But, you know, until then, between 1979, it was actually January 1st, 1979, I think, um, when the when the new policy went into effect, recognizing Taiwan as a part of China until this year, <laughs> until the Ukraine war. That's what that's the U.S. has been not not just recognizing Taiwan as part of China, but being very, very close to China, so close that the United States was collaborating with China in developing gain of gain of function research. I mean, that was a collaboration. It was a bioweapons collaboration. They had Chinese war games in North America and Canada, you know, which the United States participated in. Very, very close. And we know every single university in this country has some Chinese institute in it and lots and lots of Chinese students who are the children of very wealthy, powerful Chinese people. I mean, the United States has gotten really mobbed up by the CCP in recent years. And, you know, Steve Bannon and company have been the ones calling this out um because a lot of people haven't been aware of it but all of a sudden from love in china and also during the early days of the pandemic remember every liberal was saying not every but many many liberals were saying we should do what the chinese are doing well china's got the right attitude about covid i, I thought you're going to talk about even earlier in uh, february of 2020 when all the liberals were saying hey if you're concerned about covid you're a racist racist go to chinatown you need to uh just kiss Chinese people on the mouth and spend all your money in Chinatown because we're not racist like Donald Trump. Nancy Pelosi actually made a big show of going to the San Francisco Chinatown right then. Gives a big photo op. She's walking around without a mask on. Hilarious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From that attitude toward China to this, it's one. There's only one reason. And it speaks to it shows you how obsessed and single minded the American establishment is about russia i mean because it's because china started doing business with russia started allying itself with russia would not denounce russia for the invasion of ukraine then entered into a massive deal in which russia is selling its energy commodities to china for rubles you know challenging the 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 global dollar system um that is when all of a sudden from Joe Biden on down to Nancy Pelosi, who one minute is going to Chinatown to talk about how great China is. Then she's flying to Taiwan to talk about how, you know, fuck China. We're going to support your enemy here. The whole American establishment this year has turned on its heel against China simply because China is playing ball with Russia. Mm -hmm. 
damn, they want that. They want the Eurasian landmass so badly because they read the grand chessboard because they read this, which we have a course on, yeah, which I've, yeah. I've been telling people, I've been telling people, if you want an explanation for why the U.S. is doing what it's doing in Ukraine and versus Russia, read Brzezinski's grand chessboard or better yet, just take our course. It's all there. Walk, it's a one session thing. We walk you right through the book. That book published in 1997 laid out the rationale and the prescription for what America should do in the world. And what it said was, we must not allow Russia to ever become a major power on the Eurasian landmass because we, the United States, must control the Eurasian landmass. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've been doing ever since. They've been they've been taking his his advice, Brzezinski's advice. Um, it's amazing how obsessed they are with that, with that. With that objective, I mean, Russia, Putin, they've been ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, you could say even before the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia has been very interested in trading with us and having friendly relations with us, you know, selling us their oil and their gas and all uh, many other things, doing all sorts of trade. They've been they've wanted a an amicable relationship with the United States and the West the whole time. It's not Russia doing this, but the American elite has insisted that we must control the Eurasian landmass, including Russia, which means which means we have to have someone in the Kremlin who does our bidding the way that they do in Western Europe. And Putin has, you know, crossed the line many times and refused to go along with many things the United States wants. So they got to get him out of there. And everything gets subordinated to that. Everything else gets subordinated to that. 100,000 Ukrainian lives get subordinated to that mission, right? Um, friendly relations with China gets subordinated to that, to that, to that mission, everything, the, the economy, we spend $110 billion on this war, you know, get subordinated to that mission. It is an obsession, which is threatening to kill, if not us all, a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, uh, our, our, uh, uh, our uh, course on uh, NATO with Scott Ritter. Yeah, uh, we talked about uh, Putin's attempt to join NATO at one point, and uh, that he did want to play ball, but he wanted to be like a on an even playing field with the West if he were to join NATO. And right. uh, yeah, uh, Scott Ritter said uh, the purpose of NATO was to uh, should have been explicitly to punish Germany and to control the threat of Russia, and. Uh, I think NATO needs to exist in an antagonistic relationship with somebody else to justify its existence. Uh, mm. Like uh, you need an enemy for there to be the largest military alliance that's ever existed. If everybody in, in the country, if everybody on the planet all agrees and is all on the same page and there's no conflict and there's no reason for, for having this giant alliance. Uh, and I think that plays along with how they've treated Russia over the last 30 years with Putin. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to do a course on this. Um, I want to get down. I want to get to the bottom of this. But my understanding is that if Yeltsin had stuck around mm -hmm. um, instead of Putin as the leader of the new Russia, that none of this would have happened and that Russia would be just like Poland is now. Poland is does whatever we tell them to. Uh, mm -hmm. Poland is they're even more fanatical pro-Americans than Germans are, German politicians are now. And Russia would have been the same way if Yeltsin had been the guy, because Yeltsin did whatever Bill Clinton told him to. And um, if that had continued, there wouldn't well, be, there might not be NATO expansion and there might not be a Ukraine war. If Yeltsin remained in power, you'd see 1917 all over again in Russia, I believe. Oh, right because of the oligarchs taking centralizing the the economy under their control and stealing all the resources and all the expropriation that was going on would have resulted in and the immiseration that was going on in russia at the time would have resulted in a new revolution yeah the 90s saw starvation in russia that was on par with 1917 that was right yeah uh and it was completely at the hands of the west and how they recut up uh the nationalized soviet union uh, for oligarchs, essentially. So, right. I, yeah, I think, you know, much like Trump, Putin is is a, a moderating force against much dangerous forces over there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, 
So Taiwan, yeah. um, because China decided to ally itself with Russia, which is an incredible move that they made. I mean, people don't understand how how big this is. Uh, the U U.S. turned against China too. So now we now we are belligerent toward, and I think that's fair to use that word now, belligerent toward both Russia and China. Talk about dangerous, but yes, Taiwan. So part of that is that Biden just with the National Defense Authorization Act they just mm -hmm. signed gave, that gives $10 billion in military aid to Taiwan, including a whole bunch of new weapons that just got shipped over to Taiwan. Um, and in response to the NDAA being signed by Biden and the weapons being shipped to Taiwan, China just sent 71, something like uh, aircraft, military aircraft to Taiwan or just around Taiwan. I think the airspace just around it. Yeah. 18 J-16 fighter jets, 11 J-1 fighters, uh, six uh, drone. Yeah. Six SU-30 fighters, drones. Yeah. A large air supply. Yeah. The number I saw was 71 total. Yeah. That sounds war, right. War, war aircraft. Um, but they've been mobilizing on the beach right across the Taiwan Strait for a while. They've been holding exercises there and which I think it's like 10 miles or something like that from the Taiwan Strait is really narrow. So, I mean, it's not going to take much for China to to do something against Taiwan. Yeah. And then also the Taiwanese government just instituted or just extended the length of conscription. So you are drafted now. If you're a Taiwanese young man, you, you get drafted into the military for a full year instead of a few months. So they're gearing up. They're gearing up for war there. It seems like they're expecting war in Taiwan and um the US seems to want it which um i want to see the rationale in the council on foreign relations and the rand corporation like what are they saying behind closed doors about whether this will be a good thing for the US so we will save the microchip industry if we if we successfully stave off a chinese invasion of taiwan because most of the world's microchips as I understand it, are produced in Taiwan. Okay, I get that, but that's not what it's about. For them, I I guess it's just about weakening the Xi and the CCP regime in China and punishing them for their alliance with Russia. I think it's what it is. I mean, I think that's really the message that's being sent. It's not an accident that Pelosi took that trip just a few months after, or just shortly after China announced its new relationship with Russia. So, um, but Lord have mercy. The thing is that all the military experts I've heard from on this say that the United States would absolutely lose a war, a naval war fought anywhere near China. That they could win, you know, in the open oceans and in other, other land masses, but around China, including Taiwan and the South China, South China Sea, the U.S. has no chance, they say. I don't know, but that's what a lot of military experts say, including military experts who are like establishment types. They say the U.S. Navy can't can't handle the Chinese that close to the mainland. Well, I mean, Oliver North laid it all out. You basically plunder the American taxpayer and have Taiwanese freedom fighters fight the battle for us, I guess, and just, you know, fight the war down to the last Taiwanese. Their blood are bullets. Their blood are bullets and drones and... Mm -hmm fighter jets and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I just, you know, we talk a lot about foreign policy on this show and that's partly because of the Ukraine war happening while we're doing the show and people are more interested in foreign policy now because of that. But listen, I mean, the history of our time was determined by the big wars. I mean, World War One and World War Two shaped the whole world for all of us in some good ways and lots and lots of horrendous ways. I mean, a hundred million people, a hundred million people died in those wars. And we could kill a lot more nowadays with the technology we have and the weaponry we have. But I just wish Americans and especially, you know, my audience is great. You know, they're generally more attuned to these things than most people. But all I want for Christmas this year is for Americans to pay attention to foreign affairs and to watch the Duran. Mm -hmm. if, if you just had more people watch the Duran, we would not have World War Three. It wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Watch the Duran. Mm -hmm. Man, even if you believe the mainstream 
narratives about the Civil War or World War II, you know, about these conflicts, if you're informed about what actually happened, you should at least have some human empathy to realize how big of tragedies these were and that just there was huge, huge, huge human suffering on all sides and it was regrettable and it should be avoided at all costs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I re-listened to the Perfume Nationalist episode on uh, Gone with the Wind and they were just talking about the brutality of the Civil War and and mm -hmm. uh, back when people, I guess, engaged more with great works of fiction, you know, they empathized more with uh, soldiers who had to have limbs cut off and and mm. uh, people who had their homes destroyed, you know, uh, and, and that's completely lost in our low resolution vision of the past. Yeah. Well, also, the, the wars of the 20th century just had more bigger numbers. I mean, so it was 600,000 in, in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. But World War One was, I think, 40 million at latest count. These counts always are being revised, but I yeah. think the latest count somewhere around 40 million. World War Two is 60, 65 million ish. Um, so and I when I did my research on World War Two, I saw the New York Times in its reporting on the Pacific War in 1942. Once the war really starts, they stopped uh talking about u.s soldiers who have been killed uh with their names they stopped using their names mm -hmm. and just started talking about numbers you know x number of marines were killed today you know y number of army infantrymen were killed today um whatever it was but you know they stopped talking about soldiers as individuals as people as human beings they became just numbers because this was the first mass war you know with masses of people being involved across the planet you simply couldn't keep track of every individual. It was it was necessarily a dehumanizing project. Treating the whole world as masses of undifferentiated people. Yeah, um, that's where we are now, or that's where we could head. And um, just God help us. I don't know. It's really, really terrifying. And I wish I wish people would watch World War II movies like Dunkirk or watch World War One movies like All Quiet on the Western Front and not think, "Woo, that's a cool but maybe disturbing war movie. Think, holy shit, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to human beings. It is. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to human beings. And it could happen again. I mean, I I don't understand why 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 it's not everybody who every day does something to stop World War III from happening. I don't get it. Instead, they're worried about climate change, which still hasn't killed a single fucking person. Dude, the climate change thing is is the like splitting factor between the West and BRICS, right? It's it's oil. It's like Ooh. that's that's why we're heading into World War III is we don't want to buy Russian oil and we've got all these plans to get off of fossil fuels. And any country that wants to industrialize is seen as the enemy. That's exactly right. And the West is imposing on the poor developing world green economies. Like what? When they could instantly have better lives with fossil fu fossil fuels. Um, this is like the most disgusting form of colonialism I've ever seen. Basically bribing, cajoling, and forcing these third world countries to have solar panels and wind farms instead of just having more oil, using oil and gas. God. Mm -hmm. And of course, what they're doing to the, to the European economy is well known now or somewhat well known now. Although I'd say even Germans seem to be unaware of what's happening to their own economy. Um, I mean, those people are so crazy. They let the United States blow up their goddamn pipeline and didn't even complain about it. And now we know. Right. They just basically admitted that it was the United States without saying so. Um, I forget who was that. Someone just admitted that it wasn't Russia that did the that did Nord Stream. Yeah. Well, it might have been like some U.N. investigators basically saying that the only people who could have pulled it off were NATO forces in the region. I think it was someone was like that. Yeah. It was some very, very major establishment organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, now we know for sure it was the U.S. I mean, can you imagine that? Like major <laughs> energy pipeline to a country gets blown up by another country and no one cares. I mean, what talk about an act of terrorism that will literally kill people because people will freeze to death in Germany this winter because of that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was to stop. It was, it was to take away Germany's ability 
to reconnect with Russia, to start trading again with Russia. That's what that's why they did it. They wanted to make it a permanent split between Germany and Russia in terms of trade. Oof, the yeah. cynicism. And the problem is we have to we have to be conspiracy theorists because the media isn't doing their job. Like the media isn't asking politicians these hard questions. Right. So we have to read all these documents and speculate about these motives because like, again, the democratic establishment turned on China on a dime and nobody thinks that's noteworthy and nobody's asking these questions. Uh, yep. Yeah. Thank God we have alt media. Thank mm -hmm. God. Thank God. Thank God. And thank God YouTube hasn't kicked them off yet. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they haven't. So by the way, it's not just the Duran. I'm going to shout these guys out as much as possible. It's the Duran and each guy on there, Alexander Mercurius and Alex Christoforo have their own individual channel. And then there's the new Atlas, which is Brian Berletic, also quite excellent. And then our friend Scott Ritter has his own channel now. Um, he's great. I don't agree with everything from Scott, but he's really great in general. And then there's Douglas McGregor, Colonel Douglas McGregor, I think he has his own channel but he's on a lot of stuff i strongly recommend watching mcgregor whenever he's on some someone else's show mm -hmm. um the gray zone max blumenthal aaron mate don't do a lot but when they do it's outstanding jeffrey Sachs had a great interview with the gray zone and then he had an even better interview with the with the duran just last week everybody please it's only one hour if you're gonna watch one video it's one hour go watch the jeffrey Sachs interview with the duran last week that will give you the history of the Ukraine war better than anything I've seen. And just from that, you will know that this war is not worth us funding, mm -hmm. that we should not be supporting this war in any way. Just from that, it's it's a tremendous, tremendous presentation by Jeffrey Sachs, who's who's a total liberal. And I, I mean, he's as establishment as anybody. He's done nothing but work for governments his whole life, including the U.S. government. Big Democrat. And now he's just like throwing that all all that shit overboard because he's seen what the democratic party has been up to that interview was fascinating because uh he, he outlines why he made the switch and why he kind of woke up on these issues is because he was he was working for poland right and uh yeah he gave a series of economic recommendations to the government of poland and what to do and they did it and they developed well and I, he tried the same thing with russia right yeah i think so uh, yeah and yeah. uh he realized that uh they're not taking his advice uh because the game that's being played is not uh is a political one not an economic one essentially yep yeah. exactly yeah i'm i'm very impressed with jeffrey Sachs, and i used to be one of his haters um what he's what he was doing in the 90s he and i were both at columbia at the same time in the 2000s mid 2000s and he was kind of the big star then and <clears throat> he had just been brought on and he was doing all this stuff this international development stuff that was pretty neoliberal colonialist i think um yeah, but now he's just, he's outstanding. Everybody, please just watch what Jeffrey Sachs is doing these days. He's also the one call, blowing the whistle big time, more than anyone, on the Wuhan lab leak. He's the one who is who is doing that because he's been intimately involved in it with the Lancet, et cetera. So he knows. He knows better than anyone that there was, in fact, a lab leak and that it was all funded by the NIH. So, um that that tony fauci is responsible for COVID happening mm -hmm. <laughs> which is just the like, greatest irony of all time yeah uh and uh not to bring up kanye west again but he's the only person i've voted for and uh <laughs> it's because he was the only candidate who was asked what would you do if uh, china invaded taiwan and he was asked that by joe rogan yeah yeah what did, so, you, what did you say he said he'd pray about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which that's is what, that's what you want? It's an answer. And <laughs> he's the only person who has actually asked that question. And he's the only person who I know where they actually stand on that issue. So I think he's the only person qualified for the job. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Yay 24. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. But he was at, you know, the rapper was asked that by the MMA commentator. You know. And comedian. And Don't comedian. Yeah. 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 Primarily a stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the sitting Jimmy... president and former vice president weren't asked a single question on foreign policy at all over the course of 2020. And, you know, you could talk about voting machines or whatever and the election being stolen, but we didn't have an election. The American public was not informed at all about the options that they were given. And 
the yeah. dominant global superpower, which has 500 military bases all across the world, and not a single question was asked about foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Of the chief executive where that's the where he can actually the, do stuff. The commander in chief. The commander in chief, yeah. Of the commander in chief, not a single question was asked of the commander in chief about foreign policy who runs the global empire. The American media, that's it. That's all you, I mean, to me, that's it. That's all you need to know about the American media. They're 100% worthless. 100% worthless. I don't, I can't read the New York Times or NPR or listen to NPR. I don't agree with anything. Like it's all bullshit to me. I used to read the New York Times cover to cover every day for two decades. And now I can't read a single article except in the food section. The food section is great. Mm -hmm. Love and the, the crossword stuff. puzzle. Crossword puzzle is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend's a big fan of that. Um, but their news and their editorial is 100% garbage propaganda. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's amazing to me. NPR is even worse. Yeah. NPR is like laughable. Every time I turn it on, I'm like, all it is just white supremacy, white supremacy, white mm -hmm. supremacy, white supremacy. Woof. Uh, okay. I think uh, Nicole Hannah Jones lectures everybody on NPR for like four hours before they go on air. Oh, she's a regular? <laughs> no, I just, it's her. Oh, uh, oh gotcha. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's like training them. Yeah. Yeah. At all times. Like, she's, yeah. they got she's, an earpiece for her. She is um, a special kind of dumb. Mm -mm. Sorry to say. Yeah. Uh, so we got two things we want to talk about too. Uh, yes. the National Bureau of Economic Research put out this study about in person I mean, schooling and youth suicide. Devastating. Uh, this yeah. is devastating. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, basically, outlining a correlation over the pandemic. So, when schools were closed, uh, youth suicide dipped uh, noticeably. And then, when schools opened up back again, uh, youth suicide shot back up. And uh, over time, uh, the lowest amount of time for teen suicides is over the summer months when they're not in school. So let's make this clear again. Um, it is very clear that suicides declined in their frequency during the school closures when kids were out of school. <laughs> school kills, not COVID. School kills children, not COVID. COVID didn't kill a single school child. Not one. Not one. But school forced many of them to kill themselves. Now, I want to take that fact, that study, and give it to Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers. And whoever the president of the NEA is now, the National Education Association, the two teachers unions who more than anyone else promote public schools every day. And they win. They get an incredible amount of money. And I want to ask them to explain why this happened. Why did suicide rates go down when schools were closed? Do you know the uh, liberal response to that? Hmm. It's not the school's fault. It's the bullying. <laughs> um, okay. So well, then I would say, well, then why aren't you protecting our children from the bullies? Yeah. It's still happening on your grounds. Yeah. Bullies are all children. Last time I checked. Mm -hmm. Last time. Like in a middle school, that means they're like, they're 12 year old bullies. They're 12 year olds. So you can't, you're telling me you can't protect my child from a 12 year old. Okay. Yeah. No, there's no good argument. There's no good argument. I want to, and again, I want to take this to Kamala Harris. I want to take this to every promoter of public education and say, please explain this. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't just rely on the bully bullshit. I don't know what they would say. I think it'd be pretty flummoxing for most of them. Yeah. Uh, I forget what the exact phrasing of the Michael Malice quote on this is, but he says, uh, uh, public schools, government schools are the only place where children will regularly be put into violent situations in which they do not have an escape. <laughs> yeah. Malice is at his very best when we talk when he talks about schools and education. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. dead right. Totally right. Yeah. Um, I 
of a friend named Anthony Gregory, who's um, he's actually at UC Berkeley. He's a PhD student there, but it, he used to be fairly big in the Mises caucus, I think. Libertarian. He, he once said to me, this is years ago, before I had fully turned, he said, one day, one day we will all look back on on schools and what we did to children as an abomination like forcing them to go to those places every day and keeping them there every day for 13 years that we will net we will look back on this as the time when we systematically as a society abused and exploited and oppressed our children the most precious among us we treat them that way Somebody go go drive by a public school near you right now. I don't care where you live. Go by go drive by the nearest public school and go look at that place. Just look at it from the outside and tell me if you you'd want to spend a day there. That's what we do to our children all day, every day. 13 years of that. Yeah. Um Yeah, I was in public schools from K through 12. I know it well. I was in multiple fist fights. I was abused. I was spit on. Had things stolen from me. I was humiliated, ritually shamed, slapped in the face, you name it, um, punched in the face, wrestled to the ground, screamed at, made fun of, humiliated. In other words, a normal, you know, normal career in a public in public schools. Dad, that's um, socialization. Can you imagine being homeschooled, not having those experiences and how socially awkward you would be? Right. I mean there is something to that. I mean, yes, I am tougher because of it and I am more streetwise because of it, but I don't want to, I don't think we need to put children through that to, to make them more streetwise. Yeah. It's an abomination. And by the way, private schools are better, but not entirely better. Um, I've never been in a private school, so I don't know, but it, they still teach the same stuff, mm -hmm. essentially same curriculum, right? Same values, same politics, same culture. Yeah, um, I am not surprised by that, that suicides went down when they closed the schools. <laughs> and wow. these conservatives who talk about groomers all the time, mm. they are the ones clamoring to go back to work and put the kids back in schools <laughs> when they're being when these kids are being indoctrinated and tortured <laughs> against their yeah. conservative wishes like. Yeah, this is the issue, man. If you want your kids to be away from groomers, get rid of the public schools, man. Yeah. Raise your yeah. own kids. Yeah. All during COVID. That was the one issue where I wasn't with everybody else and, you know, screaming about we got to open the schools again. These bastards are closing the schools like, well, that's the one good thing they're doing is closing yep. the schools. Though I knew even during the pandemic, I knew that was not a bad thing to be closing the schools. Mm -hmm. Bad you for know, some parents. Certainly bad yeah. for some parents. But yeah. Some parents. But, uh, you know. Sadly, uh, some statistics rose about domestic violence and child abuse uh, increasing because uh, uh, children were at home with their parents for longer durations of time than a lot of families were used to. Yes. But a lot of families were incredibly grateful and cherished those COVID years as the mm. best quality time that they ever spent with their kids. I'm sure that's true, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I totally get that. Yep. It's mixed. It's very mixed what happened with, with kids, but a, ter a lot of terrible stuff was done to them, too. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of grooming and sex uh, yeah. and, and right-wingers, mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about this thing um, about the new homophobia. The new... Hom being homophobic is cool again. Right? Oh, I thought... No, no, I was I'm, gonna... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sex work. Sorry. Sex, sex workers, work. yeah. I thought... Sex work. yeah. Um, yeah, the new the new attack on sex work, which is a, which is which is tied to the, the homophobia, though. This is part mm -hmm. of the general. That's why I confuse the two, because it's part of this general sexual reaction that we're having this year that we've experienced this year. Mm -hmm. Grooming is just the, the loudest part of that. But there's all as part of this, there's been this this um, new set of attacks on sex work. Um, yeah. Well, I, I would frame this as like this is the divide culturally in the libertarian movement, especially is uh, yeah. do we, quote unquote, celebrate sex workers? Even if you believe that sex work should be legal, uh, should it be destigmatized? Should it be celebrated? Should we see these people as contributing members of society or should we uh, stigmatize it and try to fight it with social shame and stigma? 
Yeah. We should we should just say what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So Dave Smith is a friend and he's been on the show many times, um, is a great man and has I agree with him almost all the time. Um, and a great comedian. He said and I said he said this many times, but he said it mm -hmm. on Twitter just a few days ago. Right. He said we should stigmatize sex work. Keep it legal, but stigmatize it. Right. I don't know the exact wording. Well, of the tweet. That's kind of the hoppy and logic of, uh, you know, getting rid of things in society that you don't like so well or or yeah um so like the ron paulians uh still see illicit drug use as a bad thing and they uh see sex work as a bad thing and uh don't use the force of government which just makes things dangerous uh just use uh, voluntary social stigma to keep these things out of your community right mm -hmm. yeah so um when i ask people like this what is wrong with sex work I get no answer except it's obvious that selling sex that a woman it's always about a woman too they don't mm -hmm. never care about men doing this a woman selling sex is degrading to her it's obvious and i said well how is that obvious tell me why why is selling sex bad but selling anything else is wonderful right libertarians love commerce they love the exchange of money for services they love it when people do that except for this one thing and by the way how many how many occupations how many ex, how much commerce involves selling the use of one's body like every occupation right mm -hmm. at the very least you got to take your body to the office and sit there and work all day or you got to even take your body to the computer screen and look into the computer screen but so many occupations involve intimate uses of the body mm -hmm. right massage therapists you know, I mean, MMA fighters, um, I mean, they're doing they're doing 69s in, the, in public, you know, <laughs> I mean, there are I mean, lots well, of actors and actresses, you know, getting naked or half naked on a screen for everybody to see. That's all fine to libertarians for for men, especially. I see uh, backbreaking uh, physical labor, which is yeah. characterized men's work uh, essentially since the dawn of time as an objectifying use of your body that uh, certain people have understandable limits on yeah all of our bodies get objectified in capitalism mm -hmm. that's all it is you know when i give a talk somewhere someone pays me to fly my body across the country and go get up on stage and, and use my mouth to talk i mean it's the same and people are looking at me everybody's looking at me people laugh at this because like, well, that's not sex i'm like yeah but what then tell me exactly why sex would be bad and this is not bad they can't is it because it feels good sex is what's what is the problem with sex mm -hmm. why is it dangerous why is it bad they can never answer that question yeah what why what is it about sex that makes it so troubling and difficult and bad to sell like, or to do like what what is it it feels good okay what else is there about sex it's very intimate true mm -hmm. those are bad things you become very vulnerable when you have sex. True. That's a bad thing. We often become animalistic, right? We, we, we don't act the way we do in, in public. You know, we act in different ways when we're having sex. Yes. Is that a bad thing? I'm trying to find the heart of this issue for people about sex. What is it, Puritans? Yeah. About well, sex that bothers you so much. They, they say that they don't want to uh, celebrate it. And, and this is the line that they use is uh, because any woman in your life that you care about, your mother, your daughter, your sister, you would be mortified if they were selling their body for sex. And you'd be right. But why? That mm -hmm. just begs the question. Why? Mm -hmm. If we found out our mother worked at CVS as a cashier for 20 years, having her body objectified like a like hell mm -hmm. for that job, right? Degrading her body. That's fine. Mm hmm. But if she, if she sold sex once for 20 minutes, oh, it's the scarlet, the scarlet shame forever. I think, uh, again, the pimps are great philosophers on this point. Um, <laughs> everybody's in our society is selling sex to some extent. And uh, where you draw that line is completely personal and, and arbitrary. Uh, there's a lot of very attractive realtors with very revealing Instagram profiles uh, who are explicitly selling sex in order to get a larger profile to sell more houses. Uh, 
there are uh <laughs> you're talking about my you're talking about all my exes right now <laughs> <laughs> it's true <laughs> Right. I had a, I had a run with real estate agents a few years ago, but yeah, it's true. Um, yes, they of course are objectifying their goddamn bodies and faces to sell houses to make money. Yeah. No, I'm please someone please tell me, please tell me what is it about sex? You got to be specific. Don't just say it's obvious because it's sex, man. Like mm -hmm. why? What is it about that thing that activity that is so scary and bad? But doing all selling your body in all these other ways is just fine. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Tackle football. How about that one? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, objectifying the body in a dangerous way. Yeah, I'd say so. How about coal mining? Mm -hmm. You know, how about linemen working for the the power company? You know, got to climb up the lines in a snowstorm. You yeah, think that's objectifying the body. Yes, I'd say so. I what do think uh, there is a naivete in what i would call 2010 sex positivity okay that uh was bad for our culture okay. that uh that glorified uh like remember the whole slut walk thing yep. and that was a huge thing where yep <laughs> like just completely dumb moments in our, our culture where we acted like sex wasn't dangerous and uh i think Okay. We need to uh, acknowledge that it is dangerous and uh, that's part of living free is accepting the danger and, uh, you know, in dealing with it in an adult way and realizing that part of being an adult is living with danger. I mean, it's it's no more dangerous than a lot of things we do. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, taking drugs is dangerous. Drinking a, drinking alcohol is dangerous because if mm -hmm. you drink 20 beers, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Um, but dude, um, so yes. like Shane, Shane Gillis, for example, yes, like he, for our entertainment is downing 12 beers a night because he is a hilarious sloppy drunk. He's, he has a very, uh, unique talent to where he can slur his words and be like more fun to be around. <laughs> and that, that is a incredibly dangerous act of him putting his life on the line but we all love and celebrate him for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's on par with a sex worker, in my opinion, <laughs> you know? Like, sure. Yeah. Right. You know? Sure. No, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I want an answer. Oh, I was going to say, yes, yeah. you're on, you have a point there, though. Yes, there is a point about the tendency recently to celebrate such things. Mm hmm like sex work and being a slut, you know? Yeah. Um, again, I find that there's zero wrong with either of those things, zero, sex work or s being a slut, you know, zero wrong with it. Well, and here's the but, thing, but celebrating the, it. Yeah. Go ahead. What? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, the old line, sex is the one thing you can give it away for free, but you can't sell it. You know? Well, funny Maggie McNeil, friend of the show, um, uh, career sex worker. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she makes fun of women who have sex with their boyfriends and don't charge for it. Yeah. She's like, you're giving it away, you idiots. What the hell? You could easily make money on that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I get, you know, the celebrations in your face, which is partly explains the whole groomer hysteria thing because there was so much like just in your face promotion of and celebration of queer lifestyles. I get that, you know. And partly... as we were talking earlier, it is a deliberate attempt to subvert traditional values and traditional cultures it's a yes. you know it's, it's a form of war yes and it's often explicit people say we need to attack traditional culture <laughs> we need to attack traditional norms yeah sure no they, they make it up front no i i get that and so you know i don't mind celebrating it among ourselves right i mean if you're with people who are like-minded on this issue it's fine to celebrate it but if you're if you're celebrating it to other people who don't share your values about these things. It's a mistake because mm -hmm. I don't think anyone else should have my ideas about sex and sexuality. I'm just wondering why they don't, but I don't need them to think the way that I do at all. I'm not an imperialist. Right. Mm -hmm. And so by pushing it in their face, you're going to get the kind of reaction they've gotten. Yeah. So I do get that. I do get mm -hmm. that. Totally. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to the Hoppians who want to create their isolated communities and enforce their own laws, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to do that, just look to the Amish and establish a community just like the Amish 
And I think the Amish do it perfectly. They they offer their kids rum springa. They ha they have a summer mm -hmm. where they can see the world for themselves and choose if they want mm -hmm. to partake in it. And uh, they keep their communities isolated. And it seems to be working out well for them. And almost every Amish kid comes home after rum springa. They don't yeah. they don't stay. They don't stay in what do they call it? England. They call it or what they call it the outside. Or no, they call the people outside the Amish community English. Everybody's. Did you know that the Amish? Everybody who's not an Amish is English to them. Oh wow. Even like Puerto Ricans and black people are Amish or are English to them, mm -hmm. but they, they they have a word for the the outside world. I forget what it is, mm -hmm. but yeah, they ne they never stay, almost never. Very few mm -hmm. Amish kids leave permanently. They almost yeah. always come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the point of celebrating sex work, uh, I think if you care about the First Amendment, you really really should. I mean, you wrote your your uh, pieces on uh, how they how sex workers greatly influenced our culture and, and just about everything fashion wise we have for women nowadays comes from sex workers a hundred years ago. Right. Uh, but when it comes to f the first amendment uh, and obscenity and all that, you know, you have to, Larry Flint has to be your hero. Two live crew has to be your hero. You know, like <laughs> these people who are willing to use sex in artistic ways and to, claim complete radical ownership of their bodies and to use it however they want to you have to be on board with that in my opinion like i i see gg allen as a hero i see larry flint as a hero uh and you've got to respect these people who use their bodies as pieces of art to win over freedoms for all of us amen well sexuality is the most censored thing historically and so those who push the bounds of what is acceptable in sexuality have necessarily been martyrs and they've been punished more vigorously than anyone else over any other issue. And so, yeah, like Larry Flint, like Lenny Bruce, um, mm. who went to prison for obscenity in the sixties. So did Larry, well, Larry Flint never went to prison, but he did what happened to him. He did. Well, get he had a court case that went up to the Supreme court that, yeah, I mean, he was, he, lost, right. he would have been punished severely. That's right. Yeah. He did lose in courts, so but I never think, I don't think he actually went to jail. Although he might have actually, I think he did go to prison at one point. Didn't he win? I thought he went to prison though at one point. Hmm. I think he did. Um, yeah. So yes, they're heroes. Even though you know, I knew Larry Flynn. I met with him once, had a big long meeting with him. I mean, he's Don't was, be heroes. <laughs> you know, he was not. Yeah, he yeah. was not not a pleasant person at all. Um, not an attractive man in any way. But politically, yes, he's one of the greatest heroes of the 20th century to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. yeah. sweet. All right, man. Yep. We are ready to go to the other side. Yeah. So every week after Unreported, we go to Unregistered Live, which is for patrons of Unregistered only. It's a Zoom meeting with Michael and me. We hang out for a long time after this show, talking all kinds of crazy stuff. And if you want to join us, you can join <laughs> at any level on Patreon and you'll get the URL link is there and you can come hang out with us. So it's go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Again, join at any level. You'll see the URL link and come hang out. Michael, mm -hmm. fantastic. This was this was a lot of fun. Yeah. I love this one. Yeah. I love this, yeah. Good, good, good. Cool. Thank you, sir. I'll yep. see, you another, see you on the other side. Yep, see you there. Okay.